Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Today we want to talk about bees. That's right, how we can actually learn ways to use methods to cultivate healthy bees just to have a better world. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is an author, shamanic practitioner, teacher, and public speaker. She likes to focus on the cultivation of our intrinsic abilities, intuition, creativity, and multidimensional awareness delving into a rich territory of the shadow in order to heal what has been hidden. She is also a beekeeper and apotherapist. Joining us here on the program today, I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 Radio program our guest, Shona Holm. Shona, how are you today? I'm um, good, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm very much looking forward to our conversation today. Biodynamics is a way to heal the earth and save the bees. What's going on here? Well, uh, I, it's interesting because uh, for the listeners, uh, just uh, briefly on biodynamics, this is uh, a form of agriculture that was brought forth by uh, Rudolf Steiner back in 1923. And uh, shall I give just a quick background on Absolutely, Steiner? Absolutely, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he was born in Austria in 1861 and was really a multifaceted, genius. He, as a child, was uh, gifted with the ability to uh, see the invisible world around him, and he couldn't really discuss that with anyone. And, and then he went on to get extremely well educated in uh, engineering, botany, mathematics, um, uh, architecture. Uh, he, he was just a profoundly brilliant man. And after a while, he uh, became much sought after for his brilliance, and he gave over 6,000 lectures over the course of his life and wrote 23 books. And he really understood uh, botany and plants and also homeopathy, which is where you take a substance and you just take the teeniest, tiniest amount, and then you, uh, you um, mix it like one drop of that with 99 drops of water, you dilute it. And the more diluted uh, it is in water, actually the more uh, effective and powerful the substance is. And so in his mind, he reasoned that if we can do that with the human body with homeopathic preparations, we can also do that for the earth. And so in 1923, a fellow named Count Kaiserlink uh, invited Steiner to his estate speak to a number of farmers there because after World War I, the excess munitions that had been used, they turned those into uh, 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 pesticides and, and herbicides, fungicides, and, uh, and fertilizer. <laughs> wow. And so they told these farmers who had been farming the same way for probably thousands of years, no, this is, this is what you need. And, and so unfortunately they, they trusted these folks, and so by 1923, they were seeing a difference, a very disturbing difference in soil quality and in the produce and also in their livestock. So Steiner came and gave eight lectures to these people on what they could do, and he didn't call it biodynamics. It was later called biodynamics, uh, and so that is uh, applying these uh, very specific preparations to the compost pile, and then there are a couple of different preparations that are applied to the soil and the plants themselves, and they are applied at specific times depending on the constellation. And so this is another thing that is unique in biodynamics, though not new, and that is you plant, you sow, and you reap according to the positions of the planet. So in other words, he was working with the magnetic forces of the uh, cosmos above and the Earth forces. And so what he really he did was he combined the wisdom of the ancients with science, and he called it spiritual science, so that our material science, it, it, it just it's very reductionist, and it will take something out of it out of the place where it lives uh, and, and, and put it in a laboratory and study it away from, you know, its, its environment and it'll reduce it down to the sum of its parts rather than, so that it's the microcosm, rather than looking at the macrocosm of how everything uh, works in a very interconnected manner. And because we have 
really uh, been seduced by this material science we're in, the mess we're in. And so as a beekeeper and also a, uh, a woman who practices uh, the shamanic arts, and I make, uh, you know, that is what I do, you know, for my, my life path. Uh, it made perfect sense to me that, of course, if we want to save and assist the bees who are, uh, you know, losing forage, they've been, uh, uh, the hive has been manipulated and we've had queen breeding for over a century now. That's really done a number on them, as it would to any species. And then these pesticides and on and on and on. So I thought the way to heal the bees is you've got to heal the land and right. call back the life forces in the land. And so I am... Uh, at the end of the writing of a book that will be out next year called uh, Honeybee Wisdom, A Modern Melissa Speaks. And Melissa is the Greek word for honeybee, and Melissa was also the name for the uh, ancient priestesses in the Mediterranean uh, who served in these temples. And, uh, and so the book explores uh, a little bit of that, and, and then it goes into the mess that we are in, the abysmal state of the bee, and then it, 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 it offers... <coughs> what I know to be a solution. In other words, we can talk about the problem ad nauseum, but there is a solution to every ill on this planet, just as there is a cure to every ill on this mm -hmm. planet, illness. And uh, you've just got to be able to think outside of the box. And, uh, and biodynamics is outside of the box. But you know what, Daniel? The box is a mess. And I have no interest in staying within that box mm -hmm. because the answers are outside of that, as Einstein once said. So there's a very long-winded answer to your Well, I like long-windedness because it allows the <laughs> listeners to kind of get into the groove and figure out what's going on and what we can do about it. And the big thing, too, is this. You know, it's easy to be in the world and to point your fingers blaming the source of the problem, you know. But you have to realize that if you're doing that, then chances are you're co-participating in that pro that problem that you're pointing the finger at. And I've said many times on the show, for instance, we might talk about how do you get medications out of your medicine cabinet? Oh, you know, those dadgum pharmaceutical companies, you know, they're this and that and the other. And it's like, will you choose to go in that direction and buy the pills in the first place? Just stop buying them and become healthier, you know. Uh, just recently we were doing a program where, you know, the big lobbying, the GMO vote, for instance. You know, everybody's, oh, my goodness, you know, they should have to label this. Well, if you've got to buy foods that have labels on them, you're, you're participating in that. You know, you're not going to where the fresh food is. You know, or discovering, you know, what of these fresh foods do I buy are genetically modified. And doing something about it with your pocketbook rather than pointing the finger and going, well, my vote didn't get me that label that I need on my can of beans that says this is non-GMO, so I'm upset about that. Do you, do you get what I'm getting at? It's about personal responsibility, and that's what we try to achieve here on the show is opening doors and windows, perhaps the whole house, and saying take a look at possibilities of how you can make different decisions. Yeah, I, I, I agree, and I'll just put in my two cents where if you're on the... We want uh, you to put a nickel or a dime in. Forget the two cents. Okay, well, fine. <laughs> You're a beekeeper for crying out loud. <laughs> yes, we've opened Pandora's box, as it were. And I will just say, in my opinion, that it's a GMO labeling, I see that as a trick. It is a ruse. I say zero tolerance to GMOs, period, the end. Right. Because there are mm -hmm. other countries out there who've said, N-O, period. No GMOs in this country. That's it. Done. Banned. And, 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 and what do we have? We are given a choice? <laughs> who's, who's giving us the choice? To me, this is exactly, I have children. This is what a mom or a dad does with their little child who says, all right, look, you can choose this or you can choose this. But either way, that, mom, that parent is in control, aren't they? Right. See? So if we are blind enough to think, that, oh, I see, so we're, we, we, first of all, we, we imagine we're free, which is foolish, and uh, think, okay, well, we'll vote on this, then, you know, essentially what you're saying is, yes, okay, we'll, we'll give you that, yes, they, they're here, they're here to stay, and we just want them labeled, but this is, GMOs are an aberration. They do not belong on planet Earth. 
th- th- these people are playing God or mm-hmm. Creator, and uh, and 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 you know they're making a mess because they're not God, are they? They're mm-hmm. making a mess, and everything is suffering. And I'll tell you something in terms of the bees. Uh, the bees uh, are, do very uh, poorly <laughs> with genetically modified uh, uh, plants because, of course, uh, another thing they try to duplicate in the laboratory, haha, is bee pollen, and and they they can't duplicate it because it comes from flowers, and there are constituents in that bee pollen that haven't even been identified. There's so so very many of them. So when they feed that artificial pollen to the bees, they don't thrive. Therefore, when a bee goes to a genetically modified plant to gather pollen, that pollen has never been on the face of this earth before. Mm -hmm. And that bee has. That bee's been around for millennia. And so it cannot uh, handle. That that is a poison to the bee and its brood. So GMOs, I'm not interested in labeling GMOs. I'm interested in seeing them gone, period, the end. So there, there's, your, <laughs> there's your nickels worth, Daniel. <laughs> there you go. We do a nickels worth, even a dime if we have to. But, you know, it's really fascinating because the bee problem that we're seeing, you kind of wonder how many people are really aware of this, you know, of what's really going on and how important bees are in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... Uh, I think it's two thirds of our food <laughs> we get because of the the uh, the way that the bees pollinate these these crops. And, and originally, uh, farmers would keep bees, and there were of course you know farms up and down the, the countryside, and, and they would keep bees because of course the bees would increase their yield uh, of their uh, fruit trees and, and nut trees and and all the produce they they were growing. And then, you know, when the honey was left over, it was often simply given away. Uh, and, and this is another thing, by the way, that Steiner warned back in 1923. He said, do not commercialize the land. Don't do it. You'll make a mess. And, of course, here we are. I mean, everything is commercialized, right? Everything's mm-hmm. got a price tag on it. And, um, and we're seeing, you know, just the, 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 the horror show <laughs> that that has, Created, you know, uh, and so we've got uh, bees are a huge commercial industry as well, and of course they are used to uh, they are schlepped across the country like comfort women to uh, pollinate the huge monocrops like almonds uh, and, and whatnot. And, uh, and and by the way, while the bees are, are pollinating those crops, millions upon millions of them, uh, they are being exposed to pesticides. They can spray willy nilly those crops while the bees are pollinating them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, just the whole industrial beekeeping is uh, also an aberration. Now, bees were, were historically, they would be moved to different areas to pollinate. The Egyptians would do this. They would put the bees on boats and they would take them up the Nile to where the nectar flow was. But, of course, they weren't managing them the way, of course, they are managed industrially now. And and also, just to speak a little bit more to that, the industrialization of the bees, you've got bees, ginormous uh, uh, commercial beekeepers, schlepping these bees from all different parts of the country, and they will all descend, right, on California, for instance, in February. Well, if the bees from South Dakota are harboring a mite or something, you've just exposed all the other bees from all over the country Mm -hmm. to that infestation or that pathogen. So it's, it's a mess, and then they are propping up these very weakened bees with antibiotics, uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that's making matters worse as, as well. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, it's true, really, like not enough people really understand this, and so my goal is with this book and the speaking that I do on the subject is first to educate people on what they uh, can do with their own garden in terms of turning it into a pollinator sanctuary because if there's one thing that will wipe out a species uh, more than anything else, it's loss of habitat. Mm-hmm. So, you know, your simple <clears throat> garden can provide a sanctuary for all sorts of pollinators. So not only that, but then also to speak to the medicines of the hive, 
and I know we'll speak to bee venom therapy in a little bit here, because if people really truly understood the potent curative that comes from the beehive, and particularly with the bee venom, which, by the way, cures arthritis and rheumatism, mm-hmm. uh, my, my hope is they would start to realize, oh, my goodness, we've got to stop using pesticides. This is crazy. We've got to make darn sure that we've got, you know, a healthy garden area for these pollinators so that we will help maintain their vitality. That's a huge, huge piece. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every garden counts. And, 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 uh, And this notion that people think, well, I'm just one person, you know, and so what can I do? My goodness, there's so much one person can do. And it begins with your own garden and your own habits, just like you were saying earlier about the Mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals and the food. Well, don't buy food that you can't identify and don't, you know, put dangerous pills in your body with horrific side effects that make Mm -hmm. you sicker than you are. You know, again, I agree with you. It's personal responsibility. And with that uh, comes a a responsibility, I think, and a duty to uh, take a stand to be in service to this earth to help this planet because she is, we don't have any more time, we're out of time. I mean, we really are, and I I know that sounds very ominous, but um, there are things happening that are horrifying. They are lopping off tops of mountains in Appalachia. If you fly over the Appalachian Mountains, you will be absolutely aggrieved, uh, blown away. There's no mountaintops left with the fracking that they have done there. And then we're in my neck of the woods, and I live in Washington State, near Seattle, in the Olympic rainforest right now, there's a battle going on because the U.S. Forestry Service, which is supposed to be caring for and protecting that asset called the forest, is about to sell that asset out to the military, which is very cozy with them. The military is going to conduct electromagnetic warfare games, experiments in the pristine... Olympic rainforest. So, and, and, and that affects all the wild bee populations up there, not to mention all the owls and all the beautiful creatures and the plants. God knows. Talk about playing with fire. So, you know, we have work to do, and I want to quickly say for those out there who think their life doesn't have meaning, or for those out there who have a low self-worth or whatever, I have a job for you. <laughs> and that is your life has great meaning. And you were, in, you were requested, your, your, your presence here on the planet was absolutely requested. And you are needed, and there is a great deal that you can do. An abs- it, 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 amazing, amazing. We need every person we can to wake up and assist. And there is uh, an author, gosh, I cannot think of his name, but something he said in an interview really stayed with me. It said, he said, find what breaks your heart the most. And make that your passion. Wow. So in other words, instead of being overwhelmed by the myriad of, of, of problems that we have, well, what breaks your heart the most? Because we've got a lot of people here and a lot of problems. So, you know, we'll, we'll you know, find our way to our respective passion, you know what I mean? And then right. do everything you can to assist, you know, because you're a human being and you're a person of indescribable uh, beauty and potential and strength and divinity. You know, that's how I see people. I do not agree with this meme, M-E-M-E, that somehow human beings are a scourge on the earth. I think that's a trick also to get us to hate our own race. I think human beings are incredible. They make mistakes, but they are, we are capable of so much, and we're really at that why in the road right now. We're, we're, we're here, and, uh, you know, it's like the best of times and the worst of times, and it's scary and exciting at the same time because we get to choose now, you know, are we going to take action, you know, because it's going to take more than just umming and schlumming and closing our eyes and meditating and visualizing world peace and all that stuff. That's great, but we have to act. Mm-hmm. And, and there's more than enough opportunity, especially for those ones who think their life has no meaning, mm-hmm. you know, get involved. So anyway, I don't, I'm sorry, I hope I, I didn't mean to sound crazy. No, you're very passionate about what you're talking about, you know, and when it comes to bees, it's, you know, such a vital thing to be impassioned about because, you know, on the one hand, the bees provide more than two-thirds of the world's food. You know, they mm-hmm. disappear, and there's a whole lot of stuff that's going to go with it. 
very yeah. alarming. But then on the other hand, you also take a look at how, as you describe uh, in your book or will be describing, is the hive as a, medi- a medicine chest. Tell us mm-hmm. about that. Yes, well, uh, it's interesting because in my research for my book, uh, I, I went back to the ancients and were absolutely revered by the Persians and the Egyptians and the Sumerians and the Greeks and the Minoans, and their medicine was highly prized. And so honey has long been associated with longevity, I must say. And an interesting thing is at the turn of, uh, well, right at the beginning of the Judeo-Christian era, about 2,000 years ago, the uh, British Isles were called the honey what was it? The, uh, the Honey Isle of Beli, B-E-L-I, because the British Isles were just miles and miles of flowers for as far as the eye could see, so beekeeping was a huge industry there, and honey was, you know, you get gorgeous honey from that area, and I believe it was uh, Pliny the Elder, either him or Porphyry, who, I think it was Pliny, who traveled there, and he said, those British Islanders, they don't show their age till they're 120. And so, and then Pythagoras, uh, he advocated a diet of uh, fruit and vegetables and nuts and uh, lots of honey, lots and lots of honey. And he died at 90, and one of his students uh, died at 113, and another student died at 115. And same with uh, Democritus who was a physicist in Greece and a philosopher, and he died at 109. And, and, you know, all these guys advocated eating a lot of honey. And, uh, and then, of course, it, it is incredibly uh, strengthening for the body, uh, very, very good for vitality. Uh, and and uh, I'll tell a quick story with that. Um, the RMS Lusitania, which was a British passenger ship, it was sunk by a German U-boat in 1915. And in 1937, they wanted to get salvage divers to dive in the Atlantic and, and, and do some salvage work. And that was a very intense and dangerous and rigorous job. And so uh, the best of the best of the best deep sea divers from around the world volunteered for the job. And they trained these guys for six months. And their training consisted of rigorous physical uh, activity, exercise, very, very high, high nutrition food, and copious amounts of honey. And the last three weeks of their training, every morning for breakfast, these men would consume a pound and a half of comb honey. Wow. And then when they dove, when they did the salvage dives, when they came up from the dive, first of all, their body temperature went down to 85 degrees, and they were given a glass of rainwater, honey, and lemon. And so, and same with the British RAF uh, jet fighters, because those guys would have, they would experience, if they were very unlucky, the opposite of, um, of uh, the sickness when you, you go down too deep in the water. They would get that elevation-wise, and, uh, and, and also they were subject to very cold temperatures. It was really, really intense when they were flying. And they were also given honey after their flights and trained with honey. So... Uh, incredibly medicinal and restorative and vitalizing for the body, uh, and, and not the same thing as sugar by a long shot. So that's the honey. The uh, uh, bee pollen is also amazing, long been used in folk medicine. And folk medicine, which is sort of, they're sneering and it's very it's kind of dismissed, but folk medicine is the original medicine, and those people were very astute uh, in in uh, what they would uh, offer the sick, uh, so bee pollen is very vitalizing, and I'll just you know touch on that briefly. And propolis is astonishing. Uh, that is the sticky resinous substance that bees gather the exudates from trees and bushes. It likes it's like sap, and they will mix it with a little bit of wax and their own excretions, and then they will line the inside of the hive with that and all the nooks and crannies because they don't have an immune system. So they've formulated this relationship with the local trees through millennia, and they will pick the best trees and take those saps or exodus from the trees. And so they create this, and it smells absolutely heaven, heavenly, the propolis. And, uh, and that forms their immune system, and it keeps the hive sterile. Well, guess what? We can make tinctures out of the propolis 
And it is, it's everything. It's antifungal, antifungal, antiviral, antibiotic. Uh, I mean, it's just incredible. So my daughters and I take that in the morning with breakfast and in the evening, you know, just a little, you know, tincture full of, of, of that. And uh, that will prevent uh, a myriad of, of infections. And then the, the bee venom, now that knocks me sideways because I'd heard of it, but I didn't really explore it until I started researching for this book. But bee venom contains 70 proteins that we know of, um, and a few of them are melatonin, apamin, and adolapin. And uh, they stimulate the adrenals to create their own cortisol. So beekeepers, it has long been known that beekeepers don't get arthritis because they get stung all the time, right? right. And they also uh, have been known to not get cancer. Now, I don't know how, how true that is these days because we're exposed to, you know, so many environmental toxins, including the electromagnetic stuff, right? So, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that's not as high as it used to be for beekeepers. But certainly if you're getting stung a lot, um, it'd be tough to get arthritis. And... Uh, and this was long known by the ancients. They would use bee venom therapy uh, for people with a, a, a myriad of, of ailments from, you know, rheumatism, arthritis, osteoarthritis, bursitis, joint disease. Um, and so nowadays also, so it cures that, and then it's amazing with MS and lupus and AIDS. And it won't cure those. Those are really autoimmune uh, deals but it will uh, help alleviate symptoms. And so September 5th of this year, I just thought on a whim, well, I'm writing a book about it. Why don't I try it? Actually, before I tell that story, I want to say that in the 1800s, there were very esteemed physicians who were working with bee venom therapy. And I'll just quickly tell you of one, a fellow named Dr. Philip Turk, who was in Austria. And in 1879, uh, he was very painfully stung by bees, and he had up to that point suffered from very obstinate uh, rheumatism, and he got stung, I guess, all over the place, and his rheumatism went away. Ooh. And he was astonished because he wrote that he ridiculed that notion that bee venom you know, uh, cures arthritis, just like all of his medical contemporaries did, right? Because mm -hmm. these guys it's just a shame because the medical community has forever rejected that, absolutely rejected it out of hand. But he experienced it for himself. He wrote a report in 1888 called um, Report About a Peculiar Connection Between the Bee Stings and Rheumatism. And then uh, he created a whole systematic treatment for rheumatic diseases. And he uh, treated over 500 patients with no complications and almost every single patient experienced lasting results from it. And there have been uh, other doctors as well. And in, in the 20th century, Dr. Bodog Beck was a physician in New York City, and he also was successfully curing his patients of arthritis and rheumatism, uh, and he had a beehive outside his window overlooking Central Park. Hmm. And uh, anyway, so September 5th, I started seeing a friend of mine with who has had chronic fatigue for 35 years and another woman who has MS and who has and had MS for 24 years. And neither of these women has gone the allopathic or the conventional medical route because they don't want to deal with the side effects of the uh, synthetic medications. And um, so the woman with MS, I'll call her Claire. Uh, interestingly, I'll tell you, last summer she lost the use of her right arm, she told me, and she has a beehive. And she'd heard about bee venom therapy. She didn't know anyone who did it. But she went out to work the bees with her husband. And she said that she's, and all they do is just wear a veil. That's it. They don't wear a suit. And she said a little silent uh, message to the bees. And she said, you can sting me anywhere you think I need stinging. And six bees stung that arm, the arm that had, she'd lost the use of. And uh, the next day she went back outside and a random seventh bee showed up and stung that arm. And by the end of the day, she had full use of that arm. So that was last summer. She's had MS for 24 years. She's really, in the last four years, felt herself starting to go downhill, and particularly with her legs. So um, uh, I started stinging 
her and uh, my other friends, and we've been working with a woman who is one of the foremost experts in bee venom therapy in North America. Her name is Dr. Amber Rose. And you can go on her website. It's foreveramberrose.com. And I'm actually going to be hosting her the second weekend in January. She's going to come here and teach an entire weekend on bee venom therapy. She's an acupuncturist. So she puts bees on the acupuncture point. And it is thought that bee venom therapy was the original acupuncture, which makes perfect sense. So in any case, she had us just stinging the trunk of our body first for the first month. And you do a test sting first to make sure they're not allergic. And by the way, uh, bee venom allergies are much more rare than we've been led to believe. And, and uh, Dr. Rose has been uh, stinging people since 1993. She's never once, she's stung thousands of people, never once used an EpiPen. And uh, another fellow, Charlie Mraz, who's dead now, he uh, was known as the father of apotherapy and stung thousands of people over a course of 60 years and never once used an EpiPen. So that's something to think about. Um, not to be foolish, of course, but, you know, you do a test sting, you have an EpiPen on hand should you need it. And uh, after about 20 minutes, then you, they're fine, so you uh, do two or three stings and uh, if you sting up along the spine, midway in the spine downwards will get the whole lower body. Midway of the spine and upwards will get the upper body. And then after a month or so, you build up kind of an immunity to the reactions, because the reactions, of course, are the swelling and, and, and the redness and the crazy itching. But you start to get to where beekeepers get, you know, where they get stung often enough that after a while you just sort of you know what I mean? You don't have that crazy reaction. Mm -hmm. And so that's something we all notice, particularly myself, because I'm not, I don't have any illness. But I did have a cyst, and we stung the cyst. It was big. It was the size of a quarter. It's almost gone. looks like a mosquito bite now. You can also sting scars, and the uh, uh, bee venom will dissolve scar tissue. It's very excellent for people with bad, who are badly burned. Mm. And so I've got a big, nasty scar mm. on my back, and that has changed uh, considerably. It was bumpy, you know, and uneven, and it's all smoothing out now, and we sting the actual scar. Well, uh, my friend with MS, the first thing she noticed, first of all, was uh, uh, incredible energy. She hasn't felt in years. And so that, that really got her attention. And she said she's sleeping really well, which she also hadn't been doing for a good while. And, of course, we know for the body to regenerate and repair itself, it needs good sleep. So that's helping. And, um, and it's really... You know, we, we'll see be, beyond that. You know, Amber said to really give something like this six months. My friend with the chronic fatigue has had it for 35 years. Her body's a mess, and she's been trying all sorts of things. And so we've had to go real slow with her. So we, you know, I, I mean, I, I can take, you know, 17, 18 stings in a session. She's still doing just three stings, um, and we'll go to four next week. But in any case, she finally turned a corner oh. and she's starting to feel an energy that she has not felt in a long time. Mm -hmm. So every body is different, uh, but this is a very powerful therapy. And so my, my hope with this is, you know, to get this out to enough people to, to realize we need these bees. The medicine they carry is extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary and it cannot be duplicated by science. And uh, we, we've got to stop using pesticides. We must. There's no place for that. And not only us, we have to uh, uh, join the whatever, our local council, whatever, and uh, educate those people and get them to cancel those contracts with those chemical companies because pesticides are a big business. And I will say also real quick, because I don't want to forget, those people who, uh, those folks who, who want to create a bee garden and they think, all right, great, I'll run out to, uh, uh, you know, whatever, a Home Depot or a Lowe's or any of those places and I'll buy a bunch of flowers and put them in my garden. Nope, can't do that anymore because those large corporations are purchasing their flowers from these big corporate nurseries and what they are doing is they are dipping their seeds in neonicotinoid pesticides. I don't know if you've discussed that on your show. But uh, neonicotinoids are systemic pesticides. And the argument is that, well, this is better than spraying pesticides all over. 
better for the environment. Yeah, we'll just dip the seed in it, and then the pesticide will grow throughout the entire plant. Well, that makes the entire <laughs> plant deadly, poisonous to any creature that partakes of that plant. Uh, and interestingly, the poison particularly concentrates in the pollen and nectar of the flower. Not only that, uh, but then it goes into the water table. And the neonicotinoids will stay in the soil for almost 20 years. So it, 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 it is horrific what they're doing. And neonicotinoids have been banned and partially banned uh, in, I believe, Italy, France, and Slovenia. And, and of course, you know, the U.S. DA here is open for business, and, and there was, uh, you know, there have been some wiki leaks with all sorts of nonsense, because of course these people are all in bed with each other. Mm -hmm. and so this is another thing that we must call an end to, you know, because we have um, uh, very unscrupulous people in positions of uh, power, very, very highly influential that have tremendous effect on our planet. This is our home. Mm -hmm. And those people need to be stripped of their job, you know. We, 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 we've, th this has to, to occur. So anyway, um, so yeah, so in terms of, all right, now what do we do, Shauna? Well, okay, there are a number of uh, good growers. Uh, you can get organic seeds and heirloom seeds, and you can grow your own start, which is really not difficult. Uh, share seeds, get um, cuttings and... Um, you know, uh, part of, uh, when you split plants from neighbors. And this comes back to, uh, starts to bring us into community, which is something that we have really lost, is, is community. And, and so I see this, uh, this, this uh, effort to regenerate this planet uh, as, as, you know, it's like you have to come into community in order to, to do it. Not a government-sponsored community, thank you very much, but uh, one that is initiated by um, individuals who are thinking critically, you know, and really examining, all right, well, what can we do about this? And then real quick, too, when you were talking about focusing on the problem, you know, and then you just sort of become part of the problem or you just kind of add to that energy, there's a wonderful fellow named Peter Proctor. He's in his 80s. And there's a wonderful documentary called One Man, One Cow, One Planet. And he's from New Zealand, and he's an expert in biodynamics. And he went to India, because India has been absolutely raped, ravaged by these big agricultural companies and Monsanto and all these guys who sold the Indian farmers a bill of goods, snake oil, in the form of these GMO seeds. And then, of course, when these farmers participate in those contracts and get those seeds, by the way, these farmers up to that point had very rich soil, and they were farming in a way that was producing all the rice they needed, everything they needed, right? They were self-sufficient. What a concept. Mm -hmm. So these um, showboats show up, these dudes, with their fancy seeds and everything, and they get these guys in contract. Well, then it's not just seeds. Now you've got to buy all the inputs as well. You need lots of pesticides and fertilizers to grow this garbage. And, uh, and then, of course, the crops fail. And uh, these guys are in uh, serious uh, financial trouble, and so there have been thousands, thousands of suicides committed by these farmers who, who are between a rock and a hard place. So Peter Proctor has said, well, you know what, I can't fight Monsanto. I can't, you know. Um, I waste a lot of energy trying to, but I can teach these farmers how to restore their soil, and I can teach them how to uh, bring back, call back the life force to their land, and, and so that's precisely what he has done and, and does. And so he went there to educate these farmers on uh, what biodynamics can do because it, it, it's kind of miraculous the way it will turn around the land. And then all of a sudden these guys are seeing a return of uh, butterflies and bees and, and different birds are, are returning as well, and their produce is sensational. Well, you know, word travels, right? So other farmers are wanting to learn about this as well. And so that is what he has created, one man, one man, which is why I'm saying these people who think their life has no meaning, the power of one, you can't even imagine until you put that into action. So this one sweet guy with a good mind has, has done this for these farmers in India and is uh, assisting them 
to endeavor to turn around. I mean, it's a long haul, but it can be done. So that's what I see also. It's like, all right, let's focus on what works. You know, and I can't fight the big pharmaceutical companies. Um, my opinion is that uh, they are immoral, and that form of medicine is immoral because it profits off the abject suffering and torture of, of human beings. Uh, but, you know, I can bring forth this medicine of the beast, and this is free, by the way. Mm-hmm. And that's the other thing, because we are in a commercial system. So when you're in a commercial system, there's no profit in cures. Just as there is no profit in peace, by the way, either. We know war is big business, okay? So in Mother Nature, in nature, and we are nature, everything's free. She's abundant. She's got everything we need. Mm-hmm. So we've been seduced over the past century from, from being very self-sufficient and pretty practical and wise to becoming where we find ourselves utterly dependent on the state, you know? And, uh, and it's a corporate body in bed with all these other corporations that are uh, profiting off the uh, rape of the planet and our own bodies. So um, Peter Proctor is a hero of mine because he's darn right. You know, it's like, all right, well, what can I, where, I can, where can I put my energy in? Because the thing is, people are pretty smart, you know, and when they see, ah, oh, wait a minute, that guy over there, that works. That's working. Well, wait a minute. What's that about? You know, and they want to learn more. And, and then they'll maybe adopt some of that, and then it'll work for them. And, you know, so it's like you grow that wave. Anyway. Well, I think that you hit it right on the head is that you have to actually take action as an individual. It doesn't matter that it seems impossible. You just take action. And somebody else, it's just like going to a dance. You know, you won't get out there on that floor and start dancing until somebody else does, but somebody eventually has to go out there and do it. Why not it be you? And then after that, then you inspire others to do the same, and before you know it, the whole movement's taking shape, and it's moving with a velocity and a momentum that helps you achieve what your goals are. And in Shauna's case, she speaks for the bees. (laughs) Just like Dr. Seuss, the bees, the bees, I speak for the bees. These wonderful, wonderful flying bugs, if you will, you know, sort of a thing. And it makes it all quite fascinating. Now, when do you, uh, when is your book coming out and what will its title be? The title of the book is Honey Bee Wisdom, A Modern Melissa Speaks. And I am not exactly sure when it's going to come out, but my website is shaunahome.com, which is spelled, it's Celtic spelling, S like Sam, H O N like Nancy, A G H, and then home, H O M E dot com. And so on my website, I have uh, my other two books that I have written. I have courses that I offer. I do teleclasses. I have online classes. And I have a section called Wisdom Unfolding, which is uh, all my writings because I have a monthly newsletter. And, uh, and I write on, you know, a variety of topics. And so, she's so yeah. very impassioned about saving the planet and at least taking action. So it's a call to the rest of us out there to do the very same thing. Shauna, thank you so much for being on the program today. Oh, thank you, Daniel, very, very much for giving me an opportunity to, to voice my, my passion. <laughs> Have a wonderful, uh, a wonderful rest of the day and the weekend. Thanks. You too, and you can find out more by visiting her at shauna.com, as I understand, no, no, no. or shaunahome.com. I'm sorry, yeah, shaunahome. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> shaunahome.com, and that's spelled S-H-O-N-A-G-H, home, shaunahome.com, and you can find out more. Thank you again for being on the program today. We also want to thank the listeners out there. Be sure to visit us at our website, beyond50radio.com. We'll have plenty of resources for you there as well so that you too can step out into the world and take action as was suggested. Find the thing that breaks your heart the most, and that's what you become impassioned about. That's exactly a great piece of sound advice. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio Program, and remember, live your day past halfway. (laughs) 